Medistand. Understanding Medicine. Professor Azizur Rahman, and today I'm going to discuss this the second part of our series of lectures on ischemic heart disease. And those of you who watched the previous video, we talked about the risk factors, we talked about the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, and we also talked about various preventive strategies, how to prevent coronary artery disease at various levels. And today we will focus on uh, one of the manifestations of ischemic heart disease, that is angina pectoris. This is part two, and two more parts are to be uh, are to come. Classification of ischemic heart disease, uh, uh, I think it's all well known. First of all, one could have ischemic heart disease without having any symptoms at all. And one can have actually fairly advanced coronary artery disease. If somebody undergoes some screening workup and the person may have actually fairly advanced disease without any symptoms. And then one early symptom is called angina pectoris. Angina pectoris is a symptom complex. We will discuss in detail later. Angina is basically a manifestation of ischemia which occurs only at certain times, usually during exertion. And this is a, a, a manifestation of narrowed blood vessels. Then we have acute coronary syndrome. Uh, any angina which is has worsened, that could be called acute coronary syndrome, or somebody having ischemic pain which started at rest, that could be called acute coronary syndrome, or somebody who developed frank myocardial infarction, that could also be called acute coronary syndrome. So that is the third manifestation. And uh, yes, unstable angina, myocardial infarction, both are included in acute coronary syndrome. In myocardial infarction, we have then two types, non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, and ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Now, of course, we will be discussing these conditions in much detail later. And then sudden cardiac death. Somebody may just die suddenly and autopsy might show that he or she had cardiac death or it may be just an assumption. Uh, so these, this sudden cardiac death may be a manifestation of coronary artery disease. Uh, focusing on angina pectoris, as I said, this is purely a symptom complex, first time described by a brilliant scientist named William Hibberden in 1768. Now, if you read through his description, you will be amazed. Probably the definition is still valid and there is hardly anything which we could add in the description of angina, although with the help of some tools, some diagnostic tools, we could make an early diagnosis. But if you go through the definition, it is still very valid. What is angina pectoris? It is a central or left precordial pain here, which is compressing in nature. Sometimes the character may be different, but typically it is compressing in nature and it radiates to the left arm and jaw. It could radiate to right arm also, but typically, according to William Hibberden description, it radiates to the jaw and the left arm and is precipitated by exertion, typically some, some physical activity, and is relieved by rest. The moment patients stop doing that exercise, the pain is relieved within seconds and may be associated with sweating because any pain could be associated with sweating, especially if somebody has this feeling that this could be ischemic pain. So this is the definition, central or left precordial pain, which is compressing in nature and radiates the left arm and jaw is precipitated by exertion and is lead by rest and may be associated with sweating, very typical if somebody gives you this kind of description, the diagnosis of ischemic heart disease is extremely likely. 
although we we also consider what is called pre-test probability same description given by a very young otherwise healthy person would have less weightage but even less typical description by another person who is older who has some risk factors would be given more weightage so i think we need to keep high index of suspicion even any component out of this definition should alert you and should make you investigate the person because we do not want to miss this diagnosis uh, the pathophysiology pathology is simply narrowing so this is the normal coronary artery and there is ample lumen blood flows freely when we do exertion our cardiac output may increase 5 to 10 fold so is our oxygen requirement but there is no problem because coronary circulation also increases proportionately coronary lumen is wide open and required amount of blood is provided and there is no ischemia but if there is narrowing of vessels this much very like 70 80 percent 90 percent narrowing at rest there may be sufficient supply because at rest our cardiac output is low and oxygen requirement is also low so at rest this lumen may be sufficient to provide the required amount of blood but as we do exercise or as there is some other reason to have increased cardiac output that time this lumen will not be able to provide sufficient blood and patient would have ischemic pain only during that uh, time and once patient stop their activity the balance will be re-established and the pain will go away now this is a very typical example given angina pectoris is actually mismatch between demand and supply as i just told you in a normal person no matter how high is your demand your supply is also matched so there is no mismatch but if in cases of ischemic heart disease uh, in, in those who have atherosclerosis if demand increases but supply cannot because of the fixed narrowing of vessel that is a time when angina is likely to occur now there are certain conditions which can increase your demand for example exertion not every exertion and the exertion which is uh, high intensity if somebody walks at a low pace he could walk for miles without having angina but when the same person climbs up stairs fast or carrying some weight could develop angina so in the exertion type of exertion then emotions somebody who is emotionally very upset could lead to coronary spasm and co could also lead to increased blood pressure so that could typically cause angina in fact angina precipitated by emotions is likely to be more severe and more prolonged uh, because uh, like you can stop doing exercise you can't switch off your emotion like that then meals because after meal uh, blood supply is diverted toward the stomach so those who have uh, narrowing of the vessel they might feel pain after the meal particularly if they do some exertion also after the meal two factors combined is more likely to precipitate pain then weather condition any extreme weather very cold temperature or very hot temperature both are likely to uh, increase the chances of developing angina then pregnancy of course is a load but of course uh, at the age of pregnancy some women are very unlikely to have coronary artery disease then there are other factors which could actually reduce your supply uh, for example narrowing of uh, lumen by expanding a throma coronary artery spasm do you know whenever we say coronary artery disease we actually refer to atherosclerosis but it is possible to have ischemia severe ischemia with normal coronaries also this is due to uh, coronary artery spasm this i believe can occur in any person but traditionally this was this used to be called prince metal angina uh, by the name of the person who described anemia can precipitate angina hypotension anybody having coronary artery disease if his blood pressure drops because of dehydration or something like that that could uh, precipitate angina and there's some other factors also so both can be combined there is increased load and reduced supply that would be particularly important in the causation of angina 
you just heard the description of uh, burden but i'm going to give my own description uh, what are the characteristics of angina pain it is related to exertion and emotions it comes with exertion at the moment you stop doing exertion it is likely to go away we are talking about chronic stable angina chronic stable angina is very has got a predictable pattern and once that pattern changes we call it unstable uh, then short duration pain is typically of few seconds to few minutes it is never for hours and it is never for just a prick of pain it is i think several seconds to maybe a minute or so uh, and then it is usually diffuse across the chest in the center or diffuse and it is not possible for the patient to localize the pain in fact patient is usually moving his hand across his chest because he is not exactly sure where is the the pain hurts the most so it is diffuse central typical uh, in fact if somebody points his finger points with the finger that this is the pain this is the area which hurts that is unlikely to be in angina then variable intensity different people would describe it as different intensity some would somebody would have it very severe pain other may just little funny feeling so i think the intensity is variable and constricting or pressure that is the character many people would use different words to describe the pain but uh, i think the most common uh, the commonest word is constricting now when patient is describing his pain look at his gestures also he may be making this fist to describe that this is constricting or somebody may be pressing on the sternum to show that this is a pressure like pain he may not be able to use these words but by his gestures he is showing the pain is constricting in nature or is like pressure it has got typical radiation in these cartoons these are the areas where you could feel pain it could be felt in the epigastrium especially in uh, inferior wall ischemia especially in women or the most typical is this retrosternal area it may be felt exactly on the back on the just reciprocal to sternum or it could radiate to both shoulders in my opinion if the pain goes to the jaw it is very typical central chest pain going to the jaw not the occiput if the pain goes to the jaw uh, and is exertion related is very very typical of angina and then there may be associated sweating or palpitation and then if somebody has been diagnosed a case of angina or somebody just takes glycerol trinitrate and glycerol trinitrate relieves the pain immediately that will also be a point in favor of angina but remember some other pains can also be relieved by gtn like esophageal spasm would also be uh, will also respond to gtn because it's basically muscle relaxant it is actually the cumulative uh, assessment it's not just one factor there are some factors which carry more weightage than others but it is the cumulative judgment i think in cases of doubt it is better to consider it in jana and do the necessary investigation rather than overlooking it uh i think i i normally teach my students this way also it is important what suggests that this pain is cardiac or this pain is angina i think it is equally important to know that which pain is not cardiac because when patient comes with the pain the patient's concern is basically to know if it is cardiac now if you can figure out if it is not cardiac then i think you you can explain the same to the patient and patient will go home happy what are those factors if the pain is very localized patient can point with one finger and patient would typically point to the cardiac apex but if pain can be localized that precisely it is not cardiac or especially if that point is tender if you press that point and there is tenderness this is more likely to be musculoskeletal like costochondritis or some other trauma very unlikely that this would be ischemic heart disease 
Now, pain increasing with the movement. Of course, I, I, I'm not referring to the exertion in general, but if patient feels pain when he or she moves in a particular direction, like bending this way or that way, or moving a certain movement, if pain is related to a specific action or movement, that again is like to be musculoskeletal. Now, radiation to the occiput, the, the ischemic pain usually refers to the jaw, but not the occiput. If the pain radiates the occiput or below the umbilicus, it could go up to the umbilicus, but because of the nerve supply, it would not go below the umbilicus. So that would again indicate non-ischemic cardiac pain. A pain which is nagging, you know, nagging is something which is not severe, but it is bothering you a lot. A pain which is there, nagging and lasting for hours is not actually stopping you from doing work. So, but it's, it's not going, pain is not going. That is also likely to be cervical or some other pain. Now, the pain with associated numbness, numbness is purely a neurological symptom. One of the differential diagnoses of angina pain is cervical spondylosis. Now, in cervical spondylosis, people sometimes develop numbness. Now, if somebody says pain, which is which starts from somewhere in the chest and goes to the arm, and then there is associated numbness, this numbness would suggest the nerve uh, as, a, as a cause of the site of pain. Please do remember these things suggest that the pain is not due to uh, ischemia, you could very well have coronary artery disease without having any symptom. So that is the reality. But we just trying to figure out if this pain is due to angina or not. So diagnosis of angina is I think relatively easy. All you have to do is to give a, a patient listening. Just allow the patient to talk about his problem and I think patient will tell you if it is angina or otherwise. So very typical history. In fact, angina pectoris by definition is a symptom complex. You don't need any investigation to make a diagnosis of angina. You do need investigation to make the diagnosis of ischemic heart disease, but angina is just a symptom complex. A patient with the risk factors, uh, if patient has some risk factors, then our threshold would be already lowered. So even somewhat atypical history can be considered compatible with the diagnosis of chronic stable angina. Uh, investigations are, may not be needed, uh, but whenever we start investigating a potentially cardiac patient, we always do an ECG first. Uh, it's a simple test, but please do not rule out uh, angina pectoris or ischemic heart disease from a normal ECG. Because angina comes only during exertion, so you would expect changes also during exertion, so resting ECG might be normal. This is a, just a sample ECG, it shows ST depression. Some people might show these changes, you can see the ST depression, uh, but, and some arrhythmia also, but you could have a perfectly normal ECG in patient with angina. Then if patient has typical history or at least suggestive history but ECG is normal that what are you going to do? I think you just can't presume that patient has a coronary artery disease. You have to have some evidence and this evidence can come from any of the, these three tests. These three tests may be done and which one would be best for a particular patient would be perhaps beyond the scope of this lecture. But these three tests are done. Exercise tolerance tests perhaps would be useful in those patients who have symptoms very clearly related to exertion. Thalamus test tests may be useful in those patients who are unlikely to do the exercise required for the exercise test. Coronary angiography where ischemic heart disease is very likely and you think that some kind of intervention would be needed and you want, you need a definitive diagnosis, the coronary angiography would provide that. Normally they are done in this sequence but they can be actually done in any sequence and some patient 
the cardiologist may just decide to do coronary angiography. For example, if there's an unstable angina, he would probably go for coronary angiography straight away. Now, this is the exercise tolerance test. I think for those who are not familiar, I think you can see that this is the treadmill. The patient is there. Patient, there are electrode placed on the chest. The just the same electrode which we use for ECG V1 to V6. And then these electrodes, this is this represent the right arm, this represents the left arm, and this is the left leg, and there is another one here representing the right leg of course we can't place electrodes on the arm because then there will be a lot of movement artifacts so the principle of exercise tolerance test is that patient is put on the treadmill and then he is uh, asked to do exercise because as the treadmill moves the level of exercise increases there are certain stages we call them bruce protocol stages typically three minute stage in every stage, we increase the level of exercise. We by increasing the speed of the treadmill and also by increasing the inclination. So during this exercise, the doctor is constantly monitoring him, not only monitoring his or his ECG and also periodically checking blood pressure and pulse and everything. So there are three situations. One situation is that during exercise, patient develop the pain and there were typical diagnostic ECG changes. That would confirm the diagnosis of uh, coronary artery disease and patient would of course will be asked to stop the exercise. The machine will be uh, switched off and he will be put on the couch and the diagnosis of exercise induced ischemia is made. The other possibility is that patient did the maximum level of exercise which was required of his age. There is actually a a formula like you uh, try to achieve uh, 220 minus the age that is the heart rate which you want to achieve and we call it 100 percent and i think 70 percent 80 percent 90 percent in some cases 100 percent can be achieved and if somebody achieves his full heart expected heart rate without ecg changes and especially without that pain which we are investigating then exercise induced ischemia is ruled out. Patient may still have ischemic heart disease, but exercise induced pain, angina has been ruled out. There's a third possibility also. Some people, because of their comorbidities, because of their joint problem or because of their lung problem, they just can't do the required amount of exercise. Then we have to stop the exercise and the test is then described as inconclusive. Uh, despite all this, I must say this test is not very sensitive and not, it may be specific if you get the changes, but then it is based on the interpreter. Uh, some people would, even the slight ST depression, they would consider it uh, positive, others would expect more. I think one millimeter uh, ST depression, which is at least for uh, one or two squares, small squares uh, long, I think that would, in more than one, at least two contiguous leads would be considered positive for exercise induced ischemia. This is thallium scan. Now you can see thallium is a radioactive substance that is given to the person uh, intravenously, and this thallium goes everywhere, particularly to the perfusing myocardium. These are the three images taken from the normal person. You can see this is the cardiac apex, anterior wall and this like septum or maybe posterior wall. And this is the other view and this is another view, the donut view. Okay, cross-sectional view. So during stress in this technique, patient is again put on exercise, usually an ergometer. At the peak of exercise, patient is injected with this thallium and then he is moved to the next room which is where there's a camera to detect these thallium images and the, these images are taken. Suppose during stress patient had these images and then after some time the images are the same, no much difference 
that means there is no ischemia so this is what we expect from a normal person but look at this example at the time of stress at the peak of exercise contrast sorry this thallium was given and you can see this area is not taking up this thallium and in this image this entire part particularly this one this entire part is not taking up the uh, this uh, thallium um, uh, substance and in this donut image if compare with this one and this part is not taking up the thallium so that means these parts are not getting blood circulation because of the coronary narrowing now if that means there is ischemia now if you now ask this patient to take some rest maybe 10 minutes and you repeat the imaging and if they look at this one that area which was not being shown earlier is now showing up again in this image compared to this one this would indicate there is reversible ischemia now reversible ischemia is very important that means we can do something from a, uh, something uh, from permanent damage uh, like if you do something and that something could be some kind of revascularization we could actually prevent a major event like myocardial infarction so the thallium scan is more sensitive than EGT but it requires a specialized center it requires a specialized lab Sometimes we have to do thallium scan after ETT and sometimes there are various indications but uh, of course I'm going to talk about just the uh, chronic stable angina. And third and the most definitive uh, test for uh, coronary artery disease is angiography. This is the conventional catheter angiography and where catheter is put in the radial artery or the femoral artery taken all the way to the aorta and then the contrast is injected into the coronary artery and you can see the image now in this one you can see that this part is narrowed now this is conventional angiography the definite most definitive test the advantage of this angiography is that if somebody is found to have a critical coronary artery disease and is suitable for angioplasty of also called percutaneous coronary intervention that can also be done straight away there is another type of angiography we call it ct angiography in ct angiography we just inject contrast in the vein and we take the image of the heart with the, this modern ct machines that is very useful to rule out coronary artery disease so if you are dealing with somebody who you want to rule out coronary artery disease and the pre-test probability is that is very unlikely or very uh, or less likely that patient would have coronary artery disease then you may go for CT angiography because CT angiography is easy for the patient and uh, but if the probability of coronary artery disease is high then it is best to go for catheter angiography the proper one because that will offer a definitive diagnosis plus a possibility of PCI now comes to the management we are discussing uh, ischemic heart disease uh, chronic stable angina I think we can manage this condition with lifestyle changes with drug therapy and with in intervention in lifestyle changes avoid heavy exertion and light meals and rest after meal patient should be asked to take a relatively light meal and whatever minimum exertion patient has to do should be done on empty stomach and avoid stress if possible it might not be possible to avoid stress but uh, you should try to and you should definitely quit smoking that does not mean the moment you quit smoking angina is going to go away but of course it will help to uh, stop further progression and avoid extreme weather condition and I think this is uh, this was uh, the lifestyle changes and now we discuss the medication now in the medication the principle is you know in the initial part we discussed it is a mismatch between demand and supply when demand increases supply does not if that happens that precipitates angina so we are going to try to re-establish that mismatch between demand and supply 
all drugs which can do that they will be helpful in the management of uh, angina isosorbide dinitrates or isosorbide mononitrates are long acting nitrates they are venodilators and vasodilators typically given in 20 to 40 mg twice a day there are other types also but i just mentioned one type given twice a day and they will cause venodilatation by venodilatation blood will stay in the peripheral vessels less blood will come to the heart and there will be less cardiac output and less oxygen uh, demand and that is how this medicine work to prevent uh, to relieve angina propranolol 40 mg thrice a day and uh, this is a an old fashioned beta blocker but you could use another beta blocker the modern one the selective one or the vasodilating beta blockers but all beta blockers we expect to slow down the heart rate or prevent tachycardia during exertion so that will also prevent uh, the reduce the oxygen uh, requirement uh, of course at the expense of reducing cardiac output so one's physical uh, capacity will be limited but that will at least uh, prevent angina Typically, a combination of isosorbo dinitrate and a beta blocker is used for the treatment of uh, angina. Then, diltiazem is a drug, is a calcium channel blocking agent, which has the effects both like nitrates as well as beta blockers. So, you could just give diltiazem 60 milligram or up to 120 milligram, typically given three times a day, unless you're using slow release formulation. Diltiazem is given three times a day then aspirin uh, will not relieve angina but since uh, there is background atherosclerosis so i think it would make a very good sense to prevent further progression of coronary artery disease you could use other antiplatelet drugs also but aspirin is the traditional drug which we use in low dose then these patients we give this medication to prevent angina attacks but but we also prescribe uh, glycerol trinitrate which is very fast acting drug it is typically given sublingually patient is asked to suck one tablet uh, whenever there's angina and then keep of course he the patient was first stop doing the exercise whatever the patient was doing will stop that will suck one tablet and within seconds or within minutes the pain will be relieved and patient is instructed to spit out the remaining tablet uh, because the purpose was to relieve angina. Otherwise, it is going to give patient some headache. Uh, then, of course, that treatment is there, but sometime we have to go for more definitive treatment and that is angioplasty uh, or percutaneous coronary intervention. Although this is a very resource demanding treatment, but we now know that if somebody can afford, somebody can manage to have angioplasty early, primary angioplasty, that would be something great. Uh, but if that is not possible, we should at least offer it to the intractable cases, those patients who don't, do not respond to the treatment I discussed, particularly if they're young. But uh, of course, it can be considered in any person. And this is the principle you can see this is the narrowed vessel a guide wire is passed and then there is a balloon and then the balloon is inflated and then that opens up coronary vessels but this is going to come back and then that is uh, prevented uh, from happening by putting a stent this is the metallic uh, thing and th this is deployed there so that it would not let the blood vessel uh, narrow down again I mean not come back again so this is the principle of angioplasty uh, last and the most definitive treatment is coronary RT bypass grafting and it is indicated because it's a major surgery nobody would like to have it unless it is really necessary and those cases who do not respond to conventional uh, drug therapy those patients who have intractable symptoms despite medication and those who are not suitable for PCI. You know, angiography is done by a cardiologist and cardiologists will identify which patient can benefit from for a PCI. 
if somebody does not uh, is not likely to benefit from PCI or is not a suitable case for PCI, that patient is typically referred to a cardiologist who would perform coronary RT bypass grafting. Now, there are two top grafts. This is uh, the picture. One is from uh, aorta and there could be uh, venous graft I think these are venous graft or if somebody has a well-developed internal memory RT that could be also uh, used to put a graft of course this is beyond my scope and beyond the scope of internal medicine but this is the basic principle of uh, coronary RT bypass grafting uh, having undergone uh, this uh, angioplasty or coronary artery bypass grafting does not mean that you have cured the problem. Problem is still there. Angioplasty or percutaneous coronary intervention or the uh, cabbage are basically palliative procedure. So you would still need to prevent coronary artery disease from occurring again. So I think those things which were to be done before the development of coronary artery disease, they are still valid. In fact, now they should be implemented. Patients should be prescribed aspirin. Patients should be prescribed clopidogrel. In fact, after PCI, these days we prescribe dual antiplatelet, both of them for usually one year. And after that, if patient tolerates, we continue dual antiplatelet therapy otherwise we can reduce it to one and then statins uh, those who undergo surgery they are usually given high intensity statin even if they had baseline normal lipids uh, i think further discussion would be beyond the scope and then control of other condition and risk factors whatever patient has like smoking other things diabetes dyslipidemia they need to be fixed So that was all. Uh, today's lecture focused on simple angina and I discussed the definition of angina, William Hubbard's definition. Then I also discussed which points usually indicate a non ischemic pain. Then we discussed the treatment principle, the medical treatment. The, we, we also discussed three main tests like ETT and thallium scan and uh, coronary angiography and then we discussed three treatments medical treatment and angioplasty and the most different coronary artery bypass grafting but it's a dynamic disease I hope I was able to give you some useful information about stable angina we are going to continue our discussion on uh, acute coronary syndrome on stable angina and some other aspects Please uh, do remember to join me again and thank you very much for watching this video and this is Professor Azizur Rahman from Madistan. Thank you very much.